All right, so good morning, everyone. So thank you all for coming. Let's start while more folks join. Let's start uh, doing some quick, quick introductions in the chat. We unfortunately will not have time to go over and hear from everybody that is in the room. We have 60 people registered. So hopefully uh, more and more will keep coming in. Uh, so please introduce yourself in the chat, sharing with us your name, your pronouns and affiliation. I also see that I haven't renamed myself to include those information. So I'm gonna also add my pronouns and affiliation in my name. If you would like to do the same, please feel free. All right. Okay. So yes, keep keep bringing, keep uh, presenting yourself in the chat. Meanwhile, more folks joining. We oops, we ask that during the presentation, you please feel free to type any questions or comments in the chat. We welcome more participation. Um, we'll have some of our uh, friends here helping us keep an eye on the chat. We can save questions for later. We can interrupt the presentation. Um, the presenters can also um, feel free to, to do what's best. And make sure your mic is on mute while you're not talking, please. And we might mute you as well if you if you haven't during the presentation so um and if you have any questions any issues you can either post in the chat or if you're not able to feel free to send me a message i'm hannah schuler so send me a message on this number here 619-928-1600 and all right so we have nice we have a nice room of folks already so please keep introducing yourself in the chat while we welcome more folks. It's a great mix we have in the room today. So to help me with this webinar today, we have Consuelo. Consuelo, do you wanna introduce yourself quickly? Yes, hi everybody, good morning. Consuelo Martinez, pronouns she, her. I'm the Advocacy and Leadership Director at the San Diego Food System Alliance. Um, really excited to have you participate with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Consuelo. I'll quickly pass on to Ashley and Celise for introductions too. Sure, I can go. I'm Ashley Fent. Um, I use she, her, her pronouns, and I'm with the Heal Food Alliance. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's funny I'm saying good morning because it's afternoon where I'm at and I live in, I'm based in Dallas, Texas. Um, but my name is Celise Christie. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an organizer uh, at Heal. So, so excited to be with you all here today. Thank you, ladies. So once again, thank you. Uh, Ashley and Celise so much for joining us for this webinar, bringing this very valuable information to San Diego. Um, Hill Food Alliance, now San Diego Food System Alliance, is a member of this beautiful Hill Food Alliance. They will tell us more about it. Uh, and I'm Hannah Schuller. Uh, I'm, I am the local food economy lab manager with the San Diego Food System Alliance. And let's get going. So... All right, so uh, please keep bringing the introductions in the chat if you haven't yet. But we at the Alliance try to always start our meetings and gatherings by acknowledging all the ancestral stewards of this land on which we meet today and their descendants. And we would like to honor and offer our gratitude to the Kumiai Luizenio, Cahuilla, and Cupeño people and land. So, and also add that even though some action has been taken on the part of the Alliance to build these relationships with the original stewards of this land and to work to support them, we know a lot more has to be done and a lot more relationships are still to be built. And we've been learning a lot through this um connections with the original stewards of this land. So 
taking a moment to share our appreciation and and offer our gratitude. So then uh, I'm now going to pass to Consuelo and then to Louise and Ashley. Great. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, Yes. So welcome, everybody. Thank you again for being here today. Um, So you'll be hearing from two groups today, the San Diego Food System Alliance and HEAL, our partner, our national partner, HEAL. So we're really excited about you meeting if you you, um, haven't yet um, learned about them. So for those of you who don't know um, who the San Diego Food System Alliance Um, Our mission is to cultivate a healthy, sustainable, and just food system in San Diego County, and we're a network of leaders in the San Diego region of farmers, fishermen, food business owners, workers, organizers, policymakers, funders, and residents, all committed to building a food system that works for everyone. And our work is is shaped around San Diego County Food Vision 2030, um, which many of you may have participated in. Um, It's really a community-led plan and movement that reflects the most important challenges of our time that um, also emphasizes cultivating justice, fighting climate change, and building resilience. Next slide. I don't know if I can control the slides from where I'm at. There we go. Um, Yes, and then shall I go over the agenda, Hannah? Or is that okay? And and then just a, a preview of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, thank you, Hannah, for doing the the welcome. We'll have um the main the bulk of the farm bill heal presentation will be from our friends at Heal. Um, we'll talk about why it's important to San Diego, and of course, we want to hear from you and have um a Q and A with you all, and then we'll discuss some steps for call to action and what we can do to um get involved with the farm bill process. Thank you, Consuelo. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass it over for Celise and Ashley to start their presentation. Yes, amazing. Thank you both so much. Thank you, everyone on the call. So I'm going to get the screen sharing now. Beautiful. Are you all able to see? Perfect. Okay, great. Amazing. Thank you all so much. Uh, So yes, no need to go into introductions. We can just jump right in. Uh, so I we wanted both Ashley and I really wanted to start our presentation today and just kind of give you all a brief introduction to not only ourselves, but to Heal and to the Farm Bill. And so just to start off, what is Heal and who are we? Uh, so Heal uh, is an organization that's very young. Uh, it's six years old. Uh, it was born in 2017, but Heal. Food Alliance was really born out of no particular individual or one organization or even one sector when we think about food and agriculture, uh, but really how together we can really transform systems, not only in isolation, but through collaborative collaboration. And so uh, we were founded or created from these different founding organizations or founding members. So Real Food Generation is like a student organizing uh, based organization that really advocated for uh, local educational institutions to advocate for uh, local food sourcing and BFJA, which is the Nas- National Black Food and Justice Alliance, Union of Concerned Scientists, and then Food Chain Workers Alliance. So really intersecting many of these different sectors around food and agriculture together uh, to really bring about together how each of these anchor organizations can uh, really collaborate, creating what we know as HEAL. And so together, leaders from each of these organizations created our 10 plank platform for real food, uh, which is how we base off of all of our work around this platform that centers around health, economy, and the environment, and then specifically dives down into some of those uh, different planks. But together today, HEAL is really known as like a national multi-sector, which reverberates to HEAL as the acronym. HEAL meaning H for health, E for environment, A for agriculture, and L for labor. Uh, And is a multiracial coalition uh, that's made up of 43 organizations. And one of them being the San Diego Food Systems Alliance. Uh, And so this is our members. So this is just a quick snapshot of who our members are. Uh, They're all mostly 
uh, BIPOC led organizations or base building groups uh, or groups that are in support of BIPOC led movements. Uh, and together with our members, HEAL really strives to achieve our mission to build collective power to create food and farm systems that are fair, equitable, and just. Uh, and we don't we do this not only along with our members, but we do this with various partners and allies within the food and ag space. Um, and really excited to welcome you all, particularly in San Diego, to you know the Heal family and to all of our works, which I'm sure we'll get into you know questions and discussion later. But a little bit about our work too. We center our work around five core method areas, uh, which include storytelling, um, campaign work, and uh, being able to disperse resources to BIPOC-led organizations. But one of them that we focus on is political education and analysis. So that's where our policy advocacy really work centers around and lives. And so that's a little bit about HEAL, who we are, who we're made up of, and how we do our work, and really centering around this like policy advocacy and political education, uh, we're going to dive into Farm Bill. So before we dive into how we're working on Farm Bill, Ashley's going to talk a little bit about what the Farm Bill is and how it's come to be. So I'll uh, pass it to Ashley. Thank you, Solis. Um, so before we launch into what is the Farm Bill, um, we just wanted to kind of gauge folks' familiarity with the Farm Bill at this point. So if you could share in the chat on the scale of one to five, how knowledgeable you feel about the Farm Bill, with um, one being don't know anything about it, and five being knowing a lot about it, just so that we can kind of gauge. Oh, no, I do. I work at home. Oh, I... Three, some ones. Okay. Okay, so kind of one to three, it looks like a four. That's great. Um, so just to kind of share with you, a lot of us um, on the HEAL staff, like have, we're kind of more on the like maybe three-ish area when we started this work. So we're not coming here today as like kind of farm bill wonks. Um, we're sharing our perspective as an organization that's really committed to, as Salise said, like multiple forms of action, engaging with BIPOC-led groups, um, building coalitions to transform our food and farm system more generally. And so that's why we came to Farm Bill work. Um, and so, you know, we're still learning also as we go um, and are looking forward to kind of engaging with all of you um, in the Q&A and the discussion around kind of, you know, learning, continuing to learn more together. Um, so the Farm Bill is a critical piece of legislation that shapes our food system, whether you're a farmer, whether you're a consumer, whether you're living in an urban area, rural area, everyone is implicated and impacted by the Farm Bill in various ways. It's renewed every five-ish years, uh, so usually between every five to seven years. So if you, uh, we were due for renewal this year, uh, but um, as we'll talk about later, there's been an extension at least through next year. So um, it is a very large piece of legislation. So the 2018 Farm Bill, to give a sense, was worth $428 billion. Um, who pays for it? Does anyone know? You can drop in the chat. Um, who do you think pays for it? Exactly right. Yes, taxpayers pay for it. We all, if we pay taxes, we pay for the farm bill um, and that gets appropriated through Congress. So it's our bill, right? Like we pay for it. And at least in theory, we should have some decision making power over it because it's our Congress that's deciding how to appropriate those dollars. Um, the first farm bill was created in 1933. It was a part of New Deal programs. And what was happening at that time was that farmers were producing more and more and more grains because they were responding to capitalist incentives and speculative investments in land and a lot of tech innovations that included tractors and nitrogen fertilizers that were basically just ramping up production. Well, when you're ramping up production and you have more supply on the market, right, the prices fall. And so there was this vicious cycle of overproduction people bringing more and more land under cultivation to try to keep up. 
Um, and this intensive land use and the resulting soil depletion um, was one of the factors that contributed to the Dust Bowl. So in this time period and in this context, there was an increased awareness of the need for conservation, um, as well as a need to get, basically fix the system in a way that worked better for farmers so that we didn't have these problems. So the Farm Bill authorized the US government to purchase some of that grain from farmers and keep it in reserve. And this allowed prices to stabilize and it guaranteed payments to farmers. And at the same time, it allowed the government to distribute some of that excess food to people who needed it. And farmers didn't have to keep planting more and more and more to try to keep up. And they could instead leave some of their land fallow um, or using conservation practices on that land. So the farm bill then kind of served three related goals. It stabilized prices for farmers, it ensured food access, and it conserved land and resources. But one of the things that we have to remember is that the entire U.S. agricultural system and our, you know, economy and our political systems and all of that is built on, was built on, and is still built on um, land theft um, and the labor of enslaved people. And that's, you know, the basically the kind of foundational structure that we have in this country. And so the Farm Bill, when it was written, reflected that. It you know, defined farm owners and farmers in a very specific way as white men, um, essentially. And so any policies that don't directly challenge that will just reinforce it. So that's kind of where we're coming in as HEAL, which we'll talk a little bit more about, is that we need to intentionally and strategically um, redefine how the farm bill is written and the kinds of the way programs are structured in order to try to combat those kind of that foundation that we're that we're resting on. Um, we can go to the next slide. So there are currently 12 titles in the Farm Bill. I'm not going to go into the super wonky detail about all of these titles, but um, it is possible to add new titles. So conservation and energy were both added um, kind of after the initial Farm Bill was written. And um, another thing to note about this, um, which we we'll, might talk about a little bit more later on, um, there is a division of um, crops between what are called commodity crops, like soybean, corn, um, you know, wheat, uh, and specialty, what are called specialty crops, um, which is basically everything else. So like vegetable crops, fruit crops, all of that. And those commodity crops um, receive government subsidies through the Title I title, which is around commodities. And they receive way, way more payments and government support and crop insurance um, than do those quote unquote specialty crops, um, which fall under the horticulture title. The other thing to note that's um, of interest potentially to you know all of us doing the work that we do is that many of the programs that are designated for beginning farmers and ranchers and for BIPOC farmers and ranchers, those fall under the miscellaneous title. Um, so for example, the 2501 program, the beginning farmer and rancher funding program, those are all under that title. Um, there's other kinds of provisions for um, BIPOC producers, which are in USDA's language that they're called socially disadvantaged, which is not a term we use, but just to kind of translate, that's what USDA is referring to. There are other programs and set asides in, in other titles, but a lot of those like um, programs that have been introduced around that are under the miscellaneous title. We can go to the next slide. Um, so this is another visual of um, the kind of breakdown between some of those different titles. Um, so as we can see, the majority of funding around 75% of farm bill funding goes to nutrition programs like the supplemental um, nutrition assistance program or SNAP. Um, we can also see that, for example, the commodities title, um, the commodities programs receive around 7%. This was from the 2018 farm bill. Um, by contrast, like, you know, payments for horticulture, other programmings, uh, or other programming in that regard, that's like a subcategory of this 1% funding. So a lot of the farm bill um, funding goes to bigger farms, farms that are growing commodity crops. 
that's similar to crop insurance also those a lot of those crop insurance programs are privileging larger farmers okay um can go to the next slide so I'm not going to go deep into this either, but this is just to give a rundown of the farm bill process overall. Um, so we were supposed to be in the process of reauthorization this year before the September 30th deadline. Um, we did not make that deadline. And so Congress recently passed a one-year extension, which takes us through September of 2024. Um, in the reauthorization period, there's a few things happening. So um, there are hearings that are held in Congress and one-on-one -on -one lobbying visits, which are basically a way for community groups and unfortunately, you know, corporations to um, provide input into what should be in the farm bill. So, you know, having a lot of meetings, letting members of Congress know what our priorities are. And also in this time period, legislators introduce marker bills, and these are smaller bills that they're hoping will become part of the larger omnibus spending bill like the farm bill. They're not expected to pass on their own. They're just kind of to get the conversation started and to introduce policies that can be incorporated into that bigger, into that bigger uh, bill. And so once Congress kind of has done all of that input collecting, they've been introducing their marker bills and getting support for them by co from co-sponsors in Congress. Then the Ag Committees separately draft um, two different versions of the text. So the Senate drafts a Senate Farm Bill and the House drafts a House Farm Bill. And then they take those to the, the Senate and House uh, floors to vote on those separate bills. Then they uh, set up, th they might have some amendments. Um, so there's another opportunity for like, for example, we are planning to kind of respond to whatever draft of the farm bill we eventually get and say, you know, we want more of this or less of this. Um, but at that point, there's like the impact it can have is a little bit minor because they kind of already have their draft set out. Um, then they establish a conference committee where they take both of those bills and they reconcile those different versions and they come up with one bill that might have aspects of both the Senate and House bill. And then they take that to the full Congress for a vote. Um, once it's passed in Congress, then it goes to the White House to be approved and finalized. Um, once, it, once the Farm Bill is passed, the work doesn't stop. Um, there's the next phase of it is that it has to go to appropriations. And appropriations happens every year. Um, but it basically follows a very similar process around like a House version and a Senate version of an appropriations bill. And in appropriations, they basically have to kind of decide um, how to fund different programs within the Farm Bill. So in the Farm Bill, there are some programs that are um, subject to mandatory spending. So an example of that is SNAP, the Supp Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. The Farm Bill is written such that X amount of money is guaranteed for that program every year. And appropriations can technically arrive, override that through changes in mandatory program spending and flat funding and these different things, but it's a lot harder to do that. And there's also programs that are subject to discretionary spending. And in those programs, appropriations can decide how much to spend on that program for the next five years. So maybe the, pro the program is in the farm bill, but appropriations says, well, we're going to give it zero dollars. We're going to give it you know, a very minimal amount, or we're going to give it a huge amount. Um, so in the appropriations process, there's similar hearings and there's opportunities for community groups to get involved and say, we really need this, we need more funding for this program. It's really important to basically make the case for why, especially those discretionary programs need more funding or need funding at all. There's also simultaneously a process of rulemaking that happens at USDA where they have to decide how to implement the Farm Bill as it's written. So there's an opportunity here also for activism and grassroots input into how those rules are written. So having meetings with USDA officials um, in basically how they can implement the Farm Bill better. And then there's a process of outreach and evaluation that happens within USDA where they're sharing grant opportunities and, op and other op programs with community members, with farmers in their, in their areas. 
um, where they're working with community groups to get the word out. Um, and then there are internal evaluations that they're doing to basically see and to find out and gather input on whether programs are working or not working. So now I'll turn it over to Celise to talk about some of the problems and consequences of the Farm Bill. Yes, thank you, Ashley. So yeah, as Ashley has uh, reviewed or just ran through, you know, the history of Farm Bill, what it includes, and then the long, tedious process that it goes undergoes, um, we're all aware of like many other pieces of legislation uh, or policies, you know, Farm Bill isn't perfect. Historically, it perpetuates and prioritizes large scale industrial agriculture, among other inequities. Um, and to highlight some of the Farm Bill's kind of problems and consequences, you know, one of them, as I've mentioned, really continues to really increase corporate influence, just as Ashley kind of shared in the pie chart of like where the money actually goes and that huge chunk really going to commodity agriculture. Uh, we see that you know, perpetuated through subsidies, going through like crop insurance and prioritizing monies, specifically going to commodity type of um, agriculture, which we see through monocultural corn, soybeans, wheat, so on and so forth. Um, and this also favors, you know, a lot of uh, lobbyists that are favoring, you know, demands that a lot of corporations are asking for on the Hill at the expense of a lot of the things that our community faces when it comes to social justice, labor rights, and the environment. Uh, we see a huge land, large scale land loss over over time. Uh, we've seen, you know, particularly highlighting black farmers over time have lost 90 percent of their land over in this in the 20th century, which amounts to about 14 million acres, which is about 300 over 300 billion dollars. Um, and then, you know, we see that statistically when we look at the demographics, particularly around black farmers that. In the 1910s, you know, there was 14% of farmers in the U.S. were Black or identified as Black, whereas today that compares to 1%, and that's even lesser for other identifying, you know, ethnically or racially uh, farmers like Asian Pacific, Indigenous or Native, um, Latino or Latinx farmers as well. Uh, and then we also see fossil fuel and emission intensive models of industrial agriculture being perpetuated um, too, when we think about green greenhouse gas emissions, a lot of those things that are happening are happening on large scale industrial monoculture type of farms, um, where we see these examples through you know confinements like CAFOs, like concentrated animal feeding operations. We see that uh, through nitrogen fertilizer and insecticide usage, which has contributed to a lot of biodiversity loss. Um, and then we see that through heavy machinery that's needed to, you know, plant, harvest, and process a lot of the uh, products that are produced in these types of industrial or like large scale industrial type of uh, farms. We see this ongoing uh, when we think about our food and farming system as a whole, like as just the overall food and farming system, it's highly concentrated. When we think about not only kind of segueing from those machineries that emit a lot of greenhouse gas emissions um, or take in when we think about fuel too, a lot of the companies that make up the tractors or the combines or all these pieces of machinery, it's really only three corporations that control 90% of those sales. When we think about our livestock and we look at beef and the sector of beef production, it's really four companies that take over 85% of that sector. And then we look at, you know, seeds or agrochemical corporations. Again, we see the same thing where over time it might've been maybe 15 plus like small mom and pop companies. That's all consolidated down now to two, two big powerhouses that control over 40% of seed uh, and also, you know, insecticide, fungicide. Uh, so we see over time how companies and corporations really instill and perpetuate uh, this aspect of monopolies to really allow uh, these companies to really exert power and control over pricing, access, um, and really is not beneficial. It's really bad for farmers and as well as us as, as consumers. Along with that, we see a high emphasis on highly processed foods that really impact nutrition and health outcomes. And then, you know, we see this again, too, in the enormous amounts of food waste. When we see the statistic, you know, that one in eight people can't access the food that they need 
And we hear this perpetuated too on the language around like how we need to feed the world and how food access and food, you know, production is really like toe and toe in some of these ways. But not to keep it grim, there's also opportunities. Uh, so some of the opportunities that we see are the opportunities that we create in the space, like how we all come together to learn about Farm Bill and then think about ways that we could organize together. So I know many of you and many other community leaders over the years have organized and advocated, you know, social movements um, or addressed injustices. So we really need to continue as producers, consumers, along with other organizations to really build grassroots efforts uh, to advocate for significant changes as we've seen with the beginning farmer and rancher development program, set asides, particularly money specifically set aside for BIPOC uh, farmers and producers through grants, uh, continue to make our voices heard through our elected officials, not only on the federal level in DC, but locally in your state, in your region, in your community. Uh, and one thing that we've really been able to see too is through this Inflation Reduction Act this year, around over $19 billion uh, in funding going to, towards smart climate smart agriculture has allowed uh, additional funding to really fund resources for sustainable regenerative agriculture and then continue uh, for each of us to really continue in increasing awareness around climate change and corporate control. And so we've just dived into, you know, what is Farm Bill? Why are we working on these things? What are some of the problems and then the opportunities? So now we're going to segue into what is Heal doing on this? And what is our what does our work really look like? And so to share a little bit about our process. So, um, you know, we highlighted earlier our like 42 members that make up our coalition. So not all of our members, as we kind of shared the acronym of HEAL, you know, health, environment, agriculture, labor, not all of our members focus on food and agriculture. We're all connected, but we have a lot of labor organizing organizations or labor-based organizing organization, folks that are focused on the environment, like really diving into climate change emissions and then intersect with food and agriculture. So, and then also health, but many of them had not engaged in Farm Bill. So we wanted to come together to really collectively have a baseline of what our members uh, feel and think about engaging in Farm Bill. So we created actually this time last year, uh, a member-based survey where we asked members, you know, how they feel about Farm Bill, how they've been involved in it, what are some of the current ongoing campaigns or policies that they're advocating around in relation to food and agriculture and how that connects to our platform. Through that and through all of that feedback, we were able to draft our Farm Bill policy priorities. And then through those policy priorities, when we will, which we'll go over here in a minute, uh, we were able to take those policy priorities, get members review, input, and then overall approval to say, here is our overall heal collectively with throughout our members. Here's our Farm Bill pro policy priorities. And then to really ground us in this, like why we wanted to do this and why we wanted to seek from our members and ground ourselves in our members' perspective is to really have BIPOC or like underrepresented or yeah, BIPOC representation and presence when we engage on these issues and when we push out and, and challenge some of these challenges around Farm Bill to really think about how our, our people, our communities are being represented in these spaces. And then also pushing for labor to really be included into the Farm Bill. So as Ashley mentioned, those 12 titles, or yeah, 12 titles of the, of the Farm Bill, labor is not a title. Or when we think about farm workers, our people working on the farm, or meat packers, uh, people working in meat processing plants, all of these people as laborers in the food and agriculture system aren't necessarily included in the Farm Bill. Uh, and so how do we as HEAL, representing many different sectors, especially our labor sector, how do we increase their presence in this aspect uh, when we talk about food and agriculture? And so we came up with five policy priorities. And so these are our five policy priorities. Uh, one centers around BIPOC producers or BIPOC farmers, so providing opportunities for all producers. Uh, two is securing dignity and fairness for food chain workers and their families, so our labor kind of focused priority. Three, ensuring the survival of ecosystems and our planet, which focuses on climate and the environment and really rejecting false solutions. 
four, community investing in communities, not corporations, which directly addresses or kind of challenges the consolidation or the mon monopolization of our food and agriculture system and really advocating for, you know, local regional food economies. And then five centers around nutrition. So how we're nourishing our people and advocating for the protection and the expansion around critical nutrition programs like SNAP. And so we won't, we don't have time to go in, dive deep into all five of these, but we really wanted to highlight and touch on three that we feel uh, are really particular or maybe specific to you all in San Diego. And so first, uh, we wanted to dive into our first policy priority, which is providing opportunities for all producers. So when we think about our policy priorities and what we're really advocating for around this priority, we're really advocating for continuing to uh, improve access to credit and capital. So as Ashley mentioned and highlighted earlier, uh, like the U.S. food and farm system has really relied on the exploitation of BIPOC folks. And so the USDA is well has like, you know, we were trying to have a well-documented track record of discrimination that has really left producers without adequate support. So we're really trying to improve the continued access to credit and capital for BIPOC producers. And so even though, you know, many BIPOC producers are growing and distributing food in ways that really directly nurse their communities, HEAL is advocating that this year's Farm Bill uh, ensures that producers can, one, thrive by prioritizing funding that funds programs directly for BIPOC producers, and then two, increasing transparency, accountability, and access to all USDA programs. So some of um, the examples just briefly that we've been working on is, as you see, you know, enacting provisions from the Justice for Black Farmers Act that addresses like heirs property, um, that ha provides and asks for additional resources for land grant institutions, which is the historically black universities that also includes the tribal native colleges and universities as well, uh, that prioritizes technical assistance and outreach to BIPOC farmers. And then also continuing to expand funding for the return of stolen land to indigenous groups, tribal tribes, and tribal colleges and institutions, again, that help uh, expand programs and outreach to these particular communities. And now I'm gonna pass it to Ashley, who's gonna go over uh, the two other Farm Bill priorities that we wanted to highlight today. Thank you, Solis. Um, so as Solis mentioned, uh, labor is not currently it's not a title in the farm bill and it's not really included in the farm bill. And that was um, a, that was intentional, basically. Uh, so farm workers were excluded from both the farm bill and from other national labor acts of the era. Um, does anyone know why that is? Drop some ideas in the chat. Why would farm workers be excluded from labor laws? Anyone, anyone know? So who were farm workers at the time? So mar a lot of people are writing migrant workers, right? So the, the current base of many farm workers, we, a lot of our farm workers are from um, other places. Who Does anyone know who the majority of farm workers were in, 19, in the 1930s? Children, a good guess, right? So what people are pointing out here is that a lot of the time, um, farm workers are heavily exploited classes, people who um, are not like awarded other kinds of protections because of other things. And that is a that is um, a consequence of how those labor laws were written. The reason that that they ex that all of these laws excluded farm workers is that in the 1930s, the majority of farm workers in this country were uh, black and many were tenant farmers and sharecroppers. And so the decision to exclude them from those labor laws was a um, it was an explicit and intentional strategy that was designed as a concession to Southern lawmakers who wanted to keep those black farm workers in poverty and with very little legal recourse. So the lasting legacy of this, which feeds into like what a lot of people are pointing out, like the you know, kind of hyper exploitation in this sector um, is that um, people were people working on farms 
were were and are exposed to extremely dangerous working conditions. They were not, unlike many other classes of workers, awarded any kinds of rights to collectively bargain or organize or unionize without any fear of repercussions. And so this is a massive, massive problem on many different realms. And so we are, as HEAL, ultimately pushing for a labor title to be added to the Farm Bill. That's kind of the long, long run goal. Um, but that's extremely unlikely right now for this current Farm Bill. So in the meantime, we're pushing for provisions in the Protecting America's Meatpacking Workers Act, um, as, in addition to other kinds of protections. So I'll just talk a little bit about PAMWA, the Protecting America's Meatpacking Workers Act, which is a bill that we created with Senator Booker's office and with many of our labor allies and members, including Food Chain Workers Alliance, Public Justice, Rural Community Workers Alliance, and Fenster Ramos. Um, so PAMWA basically introduces a lot of provisions that are aimed at worker safety and monitoring, including protecting the right to take bathroom breaks, uh, having fair and unbiased inspections of meatpacking facilities, engaging in better pandemic reporting, ensuring sick leave and um, banning um, like really uh, restrictive attendance policies that basically force people to come to work really sick. Um, and then increasing protections to avoid occupational injuries, including like just repetitive in, um, repetitive strain. And PAMWA would also increase accountability, reporting and transparency about conditions in meatpacking facilities. And it includes provisions to reform the food system overall and prevent further corporate consolidation in the meatpacking industry. More broadly, even than PAMWA, we're pushing for worker protections to be included in the Farm Bill and for disaster relief funding for workers, especially around climate impacts. And one of the key mechanisms that we currently have available within the Farm Bill for doing this is through making government payments like subsidies and grants that um, conditional on having fair and safe labor practices. So that's kind of how we're trying to negotiate that and push for that even in the absence of you know, a labor office or labor title in the farm bill. Okay. Um, and then the last one that we'll talk about is the, our priority area around climate and environment. So right now, conservation is a fairly small fraction of overall farm bill spending. And sadly, it's pretty consistently on the chopping block in negotiations. Um, the IRA allocated a lot of money, as Silly said, to so-called climate smart agriculture. Um, but there are proposals by Republicans, largely by Republicans, to divert that money and other con conservation program spending toward their favored solutions and their favored programs. So. We need to right now both defend conservation programs and fight for them to be expanded and improved um, such that they actually meet, meet environmental goals and go more towards small scale and BIPOC producers. So some of our demands and recommendations and priorities in this area are that we want USDA's conservation programs to be expanded and improved, um, ex especially by expanding technical and financial assistance um, for producers to practice organic, ecological, and regenerative agriculture. We want there to be a traditional um, ecological knowledge section added in the conservation title, which would make um, traditional ecological knowledge and other local and indigenous forms of knowledge qualifying practices for conservation compliance and uh, also other programming around that. We also are demanding that those conservation programs prioritize BIPOC producers and increase set-asides in the conservation stewardship program and the environmental quality incentives programs, or it's called EQIP. Um, and right now, another problem with EQIP is that a lot of that funding goes toward large factory farms for basically being slightly less awful than they currently are or have historically been. So we need to reduce equip payments and subsidies to massive factory farms and impose a moratorium on con confined animal feeding operations and other like farms that kind of no matter what they do are still gonna be pretty bad for the environment and for labor also. Um, and 
we also need to work against false solutions. So right now there's a lot of interest in using IRA money and conservation money on false solutions like methane digesters, carbon capture and storage, carbon markets, and things like that, that actually don't have meaningful climate impacts and um, just kind of prop up like large corporations and factory farms and don't go toward um, small scale regenerative agriculture, byproduct producers, et cetera. So we're pushing for not using the, the, those forms of funding um, to support these false solutions and instead focusing on proven solutions among small scale and BIPOC farmers. Ashley, I'm sorry. I, 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 set I'm, the set yeah, can you talk about set aside? Yeah, Thank you. I, I want to move too. past it and then it not be relevant anymore. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah. So <laughs> I just said that that's a great question. So set asides are basically um, separate funding, separate grant funding pools. So um, I forget what the percentages are I think it's like maybe 10 percent in um conservation or in um equip but basically they're um like they they have one they have a set aside for beginning farmers and ranchers they have a set aside for BIPOC what they call socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers basically BIPOC farmers and ranchers um and so basically instead of um applying and going up against every single other farmer um, there's a smaller separate pool of funding that's basically you're just kind of going, you're just in that pool with other um, farmers in that same category. So if we increase the set aside, right, instead of, you know, having, you know, 5% for a certain category, we're going up to 10%. That's more of that money going towards that category of farmers. Yeah. Okay. That's a great question. Um, so I'm just going to share briefly like some of our recent wins that we've had. Um, we had a lobbying visit that we did with a lot of our members in D.C. in March. We brought a bunch of our members um, to meet with members of Congress. For many, it was or not for many, but for some of them, it was the first time that they'd done lobbying. So it was a really huge success and just like being involved in that space. Uh, we also, at the same time, participated in the Rally for Resilience and got some of our members featured in the press. We also held a week of action in late June. Um, so we and our members met with 24 congressional offices virtually and in person in our districts. And our network made 52 calls to elected officials to uplift our priorities. And we had social media posts that reached um, around 15,000 people per day. So it was a really big social media success. Uh, we also then had a day of action in September where we mobilized nearly 200 people to contact 208 members of Congress and share our priorities and demands for the Farm Bill, and also had a lot of activity on social media at the same time. Okay, and then we also have been really active in, as we've kind of talked about, around getting labor included in the Farm Bill. So we organized a labor briefing with Senator Booker's and Senator Padilla's offices, and uh, did that with allied organizations in late July. And emerging from that, there were some labor bills that were introduced by Padilla's office, uh, the Supporting our, our Farm and Food System Workforce Act and the Voice for Farm Workers Act. And I won't go into detail about those, both of those bills, but both of them would basically establish stronger USDA mechanisms and staff positions to ensure worker representation and increase the ability of USDA to address labor complaints and violations. Yes. So as we you know look ahead uh, towards next year and beyond, it's wild that we're already in December. Uh, so as you all can see on the screen, the beautiful like red star of like we're here. So being currently in December 2023, as we look forward, as Ashley shared earlier in the presentation that uh, we didn't, you know, meet the renewal period. So Farm Bill has been um, renewed for an extension in its current form until next year, of September 2024. And hopefully not possible. It won't lead into 2025 uh, in terms of another extension that we really want to include, you know, these things that we're advocating for in this upcoming Farm Bill. And so, you know, looking forward, we are, we really have this opportunity as we go into the new year before probably spring, early summer to really 
all collectively engage and think about how we're engaging creatively, strategically, and um, continuing to go all out in terms of advocacy um, as members of Congress in this time period with the extension are continuing to like draft and crude language and have this opportune time to in include a lot, a lot of the things that we're advocating for. Uh, and then again, after it's renewed and goes through the whole process that we've shared, again, the next opportune time in the midst of that is thinking about uh, opportunities to work on how farm bills then implemented, you know, with USDA and local, local, regional and county folks. Um, and so we really want to encourage each of you to continue to learn more. So I'll drop some links in the chat uh, that you are able to find information from our website, uh, a little bit about um, all of our policy priorities and how they break down, uh, you know, what the, again, what the farm bill is. There's also a marker bill blog. So just as Ashley, that Ashley actually wrote, uh, that is beautiful and taking like some of these marker bills and breaking them down and then how, you know, we as a healer advocating for them as well as, you know, any of you all could do as well. And then we just recently had a webinar. What was that? Two weeks ago? Oh my gosh. Earlier this, oh my gosh, earlier last month, because it was in November, uh, centering around um, sustainable agriculture and in farms and ranching. And so we have a beautiful toolkit um, that alludes to resources, the webinar itself, our platform. And so I'm sure that speaks to many of you all in terms of the farms that maybe you run or operate or are in community with in San Diego uh, around how to really kind of connect challenges happening on the farm, issues that we really want to challenge and combat along with a lot of the farm bill policy puzzle pieces um, together. So yeah, and then I think now we have time for Q&A. So uh, I know Ashley will post in the chat our information. So if you have any questions or want to follow up with anything uh, with us, uh, feel free to reach out to Ashley uh, and or myself and we'll be happy to yeah connect on anything. But thank you all so much. Thank you. Um... Salise and Ashley, I did see an earlier question. I know um, Hannah posted a link, but Jorge asked, how do we find out who's on the House and Senate committees? I don't know if you want to, uh, Ashley or Salise, want to share a little bit about that. Um, and I do know that Hannah posted a link, but maybe um, some explanation would be helpful or context for that, if you have anything to add. Yes, and I see the links that Hana put in the in the chat and those are legit so those I mean not that you needed anybody to legitify them but those are those those so those websites um are the websites that the government creates that highlight you know who is on what uh committee and so just to kind of break down a little bit of congress so we have overall you know 100 senators you know two from each state and then now I think I, I forget how many um House representatives we have, but you know, we have X number of House representatives from each state, and I don't know off the top of my head how many come from California, but um, each of those members of Congress are then assigned to a particular committee. So you have, you know, agriculture, you have like, um, like other, like there's, I think, like a task, like different task force. So that focus on different sectors um, of the government. And so I think you have like energy, and then you have another one. But anyway, so all of these members of Congress then get assigned to a committee. And so on both the Senate and the House side. So for example, we'll just focus on the House, like uh, those individuals that are made up of the House committee are, are, are folks from many agricultural dependent states. So you actually, we do actually have a few from California and because right now the House is controlled by the Republicans, the person who leads the House Agriculture Committee is a Republican. And then for the Senate side, the Senate is led, is Democratic, is Democrat uh, based, or not based, but the Democrats are leading it. So then the Senate Ag Committee is led by the Democrats. And then Ashley, feel free if you want to add something. Please. I just, yeah, I have, I had two things to add on to that, which is that a lot of the, the Ag Committees, it's not, it's not a super like, cool assignment that people get so mm -hmm. it's a lot of times um people who are new to congress 
or people who have big ag, they represent ag districts. The other thing that I wanted to just highlight is that this is, and we can kind of talk more about this, but um, there is some possibility that they could get another farm bill extension. And if we're not, if Congress is not quick enough in getting it drafted by basically next summer, um, we might end up looking at a 2025 farm bill, which we are very much trying to mobilize against because of many reasons. But one of them being that if we wait until after the election, we're going to have a whole new committee assignments. We've already spent a lot of time educating members of Congress, getting our priorities out. So this is kind of another opportunity for advocacy, like going into next year is that we really need a draft. We really need a, a farm bill by the summer before the election so that we don't have to like redo all of this education work and, and potentially face very different compositions of the Senate and the House also. Right. Very good point. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. And I have a just a quick question on them, and I, I will totally get to Whitney's question, but a question on the, you know, you mentioned about the pushing for that sep September 2024 deadline. And by the way, folks, we're going until 1230. So please stay on and join us if you can stay past noon because we are, the webinar is scheduled till 1230. So we, we just have a little more to add. We're going to talk more about local next, but um, regarding that timeline, um, that is a, a big risk because we do find that during election, it's it's convenient sometimes to, you know, wait till after election and deal with it afterwards because you don't know who's going to be, you know, who's going to win the election. What are the consequences besides the changing of committees? Like, what are, are there financial or um, does money run out in some case when there isn't, what, we're in this kind of limbo stage and there isn't like an extension, what happens I guess to, yeah, what happens? What are some of the repercussions? That's a, yeah, that's a great question. So um, I, I don't know the specifics of when different programs have their funding renewed, but there are, I mean, I think that's like some start in January, some start later in the year. And so if, yeah, if we are pushing it further, there are possibilities for, um, programs starting to not get funded. And the other problem is that depending on what Congress looks like at that time, I mean, we've already seen how um, disorganized it, the House in particular is. And, you know, an extension like anything else, it has to be, it has to pass. And so if there's enough dysfunction and disorganization, there's a possibility that they wouldn't be able to pass it. Um, programs would be left in limbo, like we'd have a government shut, you know, all of these things. And the other thing that is worth noting is that we have to pass a farm bill. So just not passing a farm bill is not on the table. And the reason for that is that if we, there's a stipulation that if we don't pass a farm bill within this kind of five to seven year window, we revert back to the first farm bill as it was written in 1933, which is not gonna fly in any way, shape, or form. We just our agriculture it it just wouldn't it would be catastrophic, impossible to really sustain or um to sustain. So um yeah, so that's kind of why there's like a lot of need on both sides basically to like ensure that we do pass this farm bill in the in the near term future. Thank you. Um, okay, we do have a couple questions and um, we're pretty good on time. So uh, let's see, one question is, make sure, I think Whitney had her question. I don't want to miss it, Whitney. Thanks for your patience. Trying to get back to that question. Um, wondering how open the uh, Department of Justice seems to antitrust enforcement in the ag sector. I don't know if you all have, yeah, any, want to want to give that question a shot? <laughs> yes, Uh yeah, I only smile because I'm like, oh, I, I sit in that space of work. Okay. Um, uh, so right now, I think with with DOJ, I'm not I'm not as familiar, but I know with like DOJ, FTC, so FTC is Federal Trade Commission, and then I think so, both both aspects, Federal Trade Commission and then the Department of Justice, um, are two bodies who, uh, have quite a bit of acts and policies around enforcing like antitrust but i think how they hold folks accountable to enforcing these things it's not it's not really happening um and i feel like the well 
currently right now, the director, I think of FTC has been doing a lot of work to engage with communities and hold the agency accountable to be an enforcer, particularly around um, antitrust and like addressing consolidation within the food and farming system. I feel like um, personally, as well, not personally, but like as HEAL, I think a lot of the work that we have been doing around that is calling some calling those things out and then being able to work with other folks who are kind of the leaders in that space. So one of the things, for example, that we did this year uh, was a really working with other local partners like UFCW locals uh, around the merger around Kroger and Albertsons. So there was a Albertsons Kroger grocery merger that happened or is happening uh, at the beginning of this year. And so HEO, along with a lot of other folks who are again, like really champions and leaders in this space, collectively tried to, you know, um, did sign on letters. And then we actually wrote an op-ed that got um, kind of tagged on to some of uh, local media outlets, particularly because there was a lot of dialogue that wasn't happening, addressing food and, food and agriculture workers. It was really addressing like a lot of folks rightfully so laborers at the at the grocery stores and food prices but like you know, how does that really impact farmers and then perpetuates again this whole systemic thing so uh i guess to answer your question that's something that we are actively continuing to work on uh, but i think as heal as an alliance i think we try to really work with uh and collaborate with partners and allies in that space to again build collective power in that aspect but then always bring to the forefront you know how um all sectors are really being impacted and at this time, there's quite a bit of opportunity on the FTC on the FTC side. I'm not so sure about DOJ, but FTC side of things in terms of how we're holding these agencies accountable as enforcers when it comes to uh, aspects of antitrust. Thank you so much. So we know who the contact is for, for these kind of questions. Thanks, Elise, for sharing about that work. And then Tracy asks, I'm curious about what work may be happening to change food assistance programs so that benefits can't be spent on unhealthy food? Ashley, do you wanna? Okay, yeah, I can start. <laughs> I can share maybe. Can... <laughs> so I feel like uh, some of this has been happening already, um, particularly around, I know not in, it's currently in this farm bill, but five years ago when they were advocating for the farm bill that we have now. So the 2018 farm bill, there was quite a bit of advocacy around how uh, SNAP or sustainable so supplemental nutrition assistance program uh, was being accessible to local foods. So I know one of the programs that is really popular and really accessible is like the double up food bucks program. So this allows for SNAP or the, yeah, the SNAP to be used at farmers markets to be able to purchase food directly from farmers. Because I think in the past, people weren't able to use their, because SNAP is usually issued at, like on a, a debit card uh, or like a debit type of card. And people weren't able to use them at, you know, a farmer's market or purchase directly from farmers. So in this current farm bill that we have now, there's been a lot of advocacy on that. But then also on the other end of helping farmers uh, utilize that or to be a farmer that is able to make those transactions like on their farm or at a farmer's market. So that's one big thing that's been really huge is the Double Up Food Bucks program. Um, and then I think another thing is um, like LAMP, like the local food production marketing program that's been from the last farm bill that we're really wanting to continue protecting now that protects the double up food bucks program, but then also again protects the um, advocacy or support around how people or education around how people are spending, you know, their food stamps or food assistance dollars, but I hope that answers your question uh, in terms of like how it's really how we cannot spend money on unhealthy food. Um, I, I think that there was a lot of advocacy around like being able to delineate what can be spent, what people can use their money on and, and not on. But I feel like that's still kind of pending. I haven't really heard too much on that lately, but I, yeah, actually, I don't know if you have insight on that as well, but yeah. That's that's, yeah, I think, I mean, in addition to what Salise was saying around like expanding opportunities to use SNAP, um, 
and in farmers markets and in local and regional um you know uh markets and things like that um you know there's also like uh school nutrition is kind of one of the other programs that nutrition sp spending goes toward um and there's lots of attempts to kind of reform school meals campaigns um the only other thing i would say is that like zooming out a little bit i think this is also a question of how we've structured the food system more well the food system and the economy more broadly which is to say that we've made it such that um it's really i mean it's really challenging for like many you know people if you're working multiple jobs or have to work multiple jobs to be able to like go to a farmer's market and purchase healthy food and cook it and all of that um and we've just made we've set up incentives and blocked you know wage increases and all of these things that just put people in a bind and so i think um one of the things is just like even beyond the farm bill overall, we need reforms that are better for working people, for parents, for, you know, that are catered more toward, you know, building nutritious systems for all of us, um, rather than focusing exclusively on like, you know, how do people spend SNAP benefits, if that makes sense. Um, so that's all I would say is just kind of like this, the broader system that we're operating in also. Thank you. Thank you for the, um, we're going to have, we have one last, uh, one last question before we move on. And thank you to Salise and Ashley for um, answering the questions. And thank you for, for asking questions. Um, they have been great. So uh, Kim asks, I'm curious about the findings that carbon capture for ag is not supported as they are not proven to assist with climate change or something to that um, effect. Can you expand on this? And I'll turn it over to Hannah to um, respond. Yeah, thank you, Consuelo. Um, so Kim, I'm not sure if I understood your question correctly. So there is carbon capture by technologies, which we consider as a false solution. It does allow the system to keep polluting and emitting, keep business as usual, and then have this tech fix and then try to store under the soil in like boxes that could leak. So there's so many issues. And it doesn't prevent from all that emission being polluting, um, you know, creating asthma and other health issues in environmental justice communities. So a lot of a lot of critics to carbon storage as a tech fix um, solution, but carbon storage as like part of agriculture, forestry, plant based carbon storage and good soil carbon storage is included in many ways in the farm bill, especially by the conservation programs. The idea of the conservation programs is to improve environmental outcomes, right? So, and with that would improve as well. Carbon capture. Um, what is the second part of your question here? Sorry, there's a lot in this chat now. Uh, and I'm not sure about, yeah, the not proven to assist with climate change, definitely better soil and, you know, uh, vegetation cover would assist with climate change. So maybe you're referring to the, the other carbon capture. Carbon capture. Uh, let us know if that answered your question. If not, we can go back to it, but now we are a bit at time. So we're gonna keep going with our webinar. And before I do, I just wanna thank so much Salise and Ashley. To me, this was like a masterclass. Let's all give some love to Salise and Ashley because you guys cover so well history, the most important parts um, of all the advocacy you guys, not most important, but like the advocacy you guys are focusing on is so crucial, so important to so many of the issues we face in the food system. So. Congratulations for your work. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And uh, now let's go back to the idea of why the Farm Bill is important to San Diego. Ground a little bit in our um, in our local work. So I'm gonna pass it to Consuelo for her to go over this first part. And then thank I'll you, Hannah. Thank you, everyone, for sticking with us. We're almost at the end. Um, and yes, uh, I agree with Hannah. It was great. Sadis and Ashley, thank you so much. Um, learned so much. And even just the questions from our participants, thank you all for your great questions. There's just a lot of knowledge in this space. And I want to 
be continue the conversation beyond today because there's there's still a lot that we can learn from each other. So um, as I mentioned with the San Diego Food Alliance, you know, uh, the Farm Bill is something pretty, you know, new to me. I had never heard about it until uh, working for the Alliance. And really the reason that we reached out to HEAL um, for this uh, webinar is because we noticed that in San Diego, aside from, you know, like the Farm Bureau, there wasn't really any information about the Farm Bill in San Diego. So we looked to see if partners or people within our network were offering this information so we could learn more and we didn't find it. So that's why we decided to partner with Heal, who was already doing these um these workshops and um, having um, advocacy efforts. And really, because we focus more on the local, we really rely on our state and national partners to inform us about state and national legislation that is important for us, because ultimately, all of that does trickle down to local. So around, we, we learned that nutrition is um, central to the Farm Bill. Um, so for San Diego, approximately one in three San Diegans experience food insecurity. And the majority of food assistance in San Diego is provided by federal programs, over 90%. And more than 75% of the Farm Bill budget is dedicated to nutrition. And um, almost 300,000 San Diego residents receive SNAP benefits. And more than 285,000 San Diego County residents are eligible but not enrolled for CalFresh benefits. And one of the things that we've also learned through our um, through our network is that since the COVID pandemic, the need for food assistance has dramatically increased. Um, and that is still happening. In fact, in our food recovery community table, we heard that, you know, at the height of the pandemic, they're starting to see lines like that and donations are down. So they're seeing kind of, you know, these this high demand for, for food at food banks um, that is even to the extent of the height of the pandemic and even surpassing some of that. Okay, next slide. And I believe my colleague Hannah is gonna cover on agriculture. Yes, thank you, Consuelo. Sorry, I, I'm distracted here in the chat because the the discussion that you bring, Kim, I'm quite passionate about it and I would love to spend the rest of our time talking about it, but I'll, I'll bring back that discussion as I go over this final slides. Um, but yeah, there's some interesting discussion going on in the chat. Um, so yeah, another very important reason why the Farm Bill is so relevant in San Diego is because we are such a, uh, farming is such an important sector of San Diego economy and identity, right? We have more small farms than any other county in the United States. Uh, it is like the number one in California in organic producers. So most farms in any other county in California and also a greatest diversity of farmers in the state. And this contributes large amounts to the economy and to the creation of jobs, right? Um, but these small farmers we have here in San Diego, they face several challenges to keep farming. And we see more and more farmers giving up on, on farming, which is very uh, sad reality we, hear, we see here because of declining agricultural lands, the cost of water, the high cost, always increasing, ever increasing cost of water and the cost of labor, the changing climate, we hear testimonies from many farmers of, uh, of their per noticing the climate change in their practices during their harvest and all. Uh, the limited business and technical support services, which is something the Alliance is trying to address um, also by this new initiative that we are working on called the Local Food Economy Lab which you can all learn more about. We can send more information, uh, but it's also to address some of the challenges that these producers are facing. Um, and the farmers of color experience significant uh, disparities, right? All the small and mid-sized farmers, also including, I'm including here fishermen and food business owners, because it's also part of the work that we are doing, not just with farmers, you know, including food processors, manufacturers, restaurants, and retailers, they all, uh, we see most of them struggling to make a living, to maintain their business viables. And, and for producers and retailers and fishermen of color, they experience significant disparities, right? And, and especially in land and business ownership. So for instance, less than 10% of farmland ownership 
uh, is by people, uh, by farmers of color, and they receive less than 2% of the farm sales. So we see that disparity here in San Diego as well. Um, and just continue, so continuing the, the farm bill, a lot of the funds, as Ashley and Celine said, devoted to the farm to farming in the farm bill are mainly spent on large scale farms, right? Uh, some of the largest buckets of cash don't benefit San Diego farmers, right? Because they go to large scale large scale farms that are cultivating commodity crops such as soybeans, corn, wheat, rice, and so on. And San Diego farmers grow very little or none of this, right? So crop those, when she showed the, the pie chart, right? We could see that crop insurance and commodity subsidies would make up a majority of the funds that go to agriculture in the farm bill, um, excluding the nutrition title. And even though those programs are designed to have positive environmental outcomes, such as the conservation programs, a lot of it is unfortunately being used to, to fund big polluting activities, as we were saying, the concentrated animal feeding operations and so on. So a lot of groups are advocating for these programs to have safeguards. So big polluting um, farms cannot make use of these funds, which are already very reduced for small scale farmers and yet still are being used by large polluting facilities. And because our farmers here in San Diego don't produce these crops, they get none, they, they don't get prioritized in this farm bill. They don't get those billions um, that it is showing here in the slides for, for their production, right? So all those strawberries, avocados, lemons, oranges, tomatoes that we produce here in San Diego are all considered specialty, specialty crops, not commodities. And therefore they fall into the title of horticulture, which is a very, very tiny piece of, of the pie. And many of the other grants and loans and, and, and pro assistance programs that could be helpful for small scale farmers like the ones we have in San Diego, also fail to assist many of these farmers by different reasons because of how they're structured and many things. For instance, it's much easier to ensure monoculture than a biodiverse crop plantation. So lots of things are inherently hard for farmers that are diverse and small scale to, to access. Um, so here my last slide. So in a in a happier note, like we said, not everything uh, is so grim because indeed the farm bill is very crucial to keep farmers farming, San Diego farmers farming. And some examples of programs that are useful or at least could be useful uh, for farmers in San Diego are, for instance, the local agriculture market program, which uh, includes it's like an umbrella program that encompasses three other programs farmers market local food promotion regional food system partnerships and those and the value added producer grant and those initiatives seek to develop new market opportunities for local farmers and food businesses and those are very important for san diego county which has this thriving food manufacturing industry that unfortunately currently have nearly all of its raw materials coming from elsewhere. So programs like this that try to um, connect the local supply with the food producers and so on are very important. And we help farmers through the local food economy lab, for instance, to write applications for grants like this. And even though they wrote amazing projects, uh, that were submitted with the help sometimes of professional grant writers, we see many of them not being awarded, right? We, it's a very competitive process. So imagine what chance a farmer has that is not receiving formal support or that is not, does not have access to a grant writer. What chance does that farmer have to be awarded, right? Farmers have to be farming. So a lot of this uh, so we see a lot of issues with these programs that are specially designed for farmers like the San Diego ones. Um, the conservation programs, we talked a lot about many of the issues, you know, it encompasses equip, 
uh, conservation stewardship programs and many others. And the Farm Bill also have programs that support agriculture, um, urban agriculture, organic producers, which are very relevant for our region, right? Um, so even though this far, these programs are designed to benefit the small scale farmers, there's the many difficulties that we've been seeing for farmers to access that. And looking at those difficulties, I would uh, say that it's very important for us to advocate for more democratic information. So to reduce the bureaucratic paperwork and, uh, and have more simplified information and application processes, you know, applying for these grants are very hard already for small farmers, but managing and doing all the report back and the reimbursements once they get the awards, it's super complicated and many shy away from even applying, knowing that it might not be worth it, their time, which they need to spend out in the fields. So having all that process being more simplified and adequate for small scale farmers, sometimes an operation of one, two people, um, broadening the outreach to all types of farmers would be very important as well, because many farmers are not aware of the programs that exist as well, which is something we're also trying to help farmers with through our local food economy lab. So it'd be important to advocate for broader outreach um, to ensure that they know about all the opportunities available to them. And, um, and that also comes down to the USDA making more efforts, being more accessible and making more efforts to build stronger relationships, especially with farmers of color, given their historical negative experience with the institution, right? A pretty bad track record, with, especially for those farmers of color. We talked about increasing set-asides, right? For what, we, what they call socially disadvantaged farmers, but pretty much to help uh, more farmers of color, beginner farmers and ranchers and so on. Um, and also restructure reimbursement systems and matching requirements. So for many programs, such as the ones we've been talking about here, Equip and so on, the funding is delivered on a reimbursement basis and farmers are expected to like pay up front for their practices. Um, and some of those projects may require tons of thousands of dollars out of pocket costs before they get reimbursement, they reimbursed. And that could mean that it's not accessible for many farmers, right? So why not uh, just reduce that stress and make cash advance, you know, provide cash advance for farmers that are in low income state and so on. And also many grants um, require match requirements. Let's say for every dollar you receive for the grant, you have to match with another funding of your own, which also represents um, a barrier for many people. So just to summarize, to make, uh, to make the short, the, the small piece of the pie that the Farm Bill has available available to small scale farmers be actually accessible for farmers in San Diego. A lot of changes have to be made and we can all advocate for that. You know, SDA should really democratize the rules of the program and build strong and sustainable relationships with the farmers, have more flexibility. Um, so we can all advocate for that. And, and to finish us up, I'm going to pass it back to Consuelo to talk uh, about how we can uh, participate in the, this process more. Great, thank you so much, Hannah. Lots of good information. We have five minutes left, so I'm gonna power through the next couple slides. But I wanted to let you know, um, here at the San Diego Food System Alliance, we do have San Diego Food Vision 2030, which is our policy platform. And I encourage you all to look at it. It has its own dedicated website. You can find it on, on, on our website. Um, so in partnership with our network and stewardship committee, we've identified for um, this time being our, um, five policy priorities that we're going to um, be working on and have already started working on. One is improving the quality of life for food system workers. And Hanna talked a lot about the local food economy lab and the work that we're doing there. Um, supporting the viability of local farms, fisheries, and food businesses. 
increasing climate smart agriculture. And we know that this topic is, you know, one that we got to have further discussion. We see the discussions happening in the chat. So there's more to be continued on that. And really, um, that is something that it has been very important for our region. And while we're not necessarily um, have a community table or are specifically working on a campaign for that, we do know a lot of our um, folks in our network are um, working in the climate ag, climate smart ag space. Um, expand community ag and promote food sovereignty, uh, the need for um, land, access to land. We talked about how difficult that is, how expensive that is. That is definitely a challenge for our reason, our region and something that we're um, working on uh, through our community tables um, and also the local food economy lab. Scaling up food waste prevention and recovery, another um, priority, super important. Um, and also we have a community table around um, food recovery and supporting grassroots food recovery organizations as they ensure that um, food does not get wasted and that food is given to folks who need it most. Um, so those are some of the things that we're working on. And if any of these priorities resonate with you, like uh, please reach out. We're going to share our contact information um, because that is what we're working on at the Alliance. And we would love to partner with you, hear from you um, on how to move these um, policies forward. Uh, next slide. So how to get involved with us. So you are all on our email list now. Thank you for signing up. Um, we encourage you to um, stay in touch with us, stay engaged, contact your representatives, and we'll share those opportunities. Also, the Heal Alliance um, talked about their toolkit, and they shared the link earlier. I will send a follow-up email uh, this week. with. Uh, we'll have a link to the recording, the slides, as well as um, links that we've shared with you all. And then we're in the process processes of, of developing our advocacy alerts for the San Diego Food System Alliance. So once that link is ready, please, I, I'm going to send it out to all of you. I would encourage you all to sign up so that you can know about opportunities to engage with elected officials, whether at the local level or beyond San Diego, in order to share the stories of what's um, and the needs of San Diego, because really it's up to us to, to voice what we need. And we know that not all regions, not all communities are the same and we have unique needs. So we need to be able to share that with decision makers. Um, and in the advocacy alerts list, we'll also ask for your zip code. And the reason we ask is because we want to know who you, we, it's easier to match up with your representatives and what districts you're in is if we know your zip code. So we're not trying to be nosy. We just want to be, um, you know, strategic and helpful in connecting you to the right folks who need to hear from you, their constituents. Next slide. Um, again, this is another, uh, just a, another uh, snapshot of Heal Food Alliance website and how you can get involved. And we'll also share that link. Next slide. And the next slide is our contact information. It's been a pleasure having you on this webinar. Thank you for staying with us for uh, an hour and a half. Please uh, stay engaged, stay in touch with us. And if you have questions, reach out via email. And I know that there's gonna be continuing conversations. We definitely wanna continue to hear from you. We don't want this to be the last conversation on the Farm Bill. Um, really appreciate your engagement. Thank you again to uh, Heal for being here, Salise and Ashley, for all the information. Um, and so we will be reaching out. So please respond to those emails, ask us your questions. And I look forward to staying in touch with you and um, learning from you all during this process. And we're at 1230. Yeah, so yay, we finished on time. Yeah, we unfortunately didn't have time to keep our Q&A and discussion moment going, but I think we covered so much. Thank you everybody for being here. We'll circle back with our follow-up email. I'm gonna stop the recording now. Oh, thank you. <laughs>